Hello, today is October 7th, 2008. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today Carl J. Mueller. Welcome, Carl. Thank you for coming. May I ask you when you were born? June 28th, 1921. And where were you born? Waltham. And where do you currently live? Waltham. Have you lived there most of your life? All, my All life. your life. And your marital status? Yes. Married? Married. For how long? 65 years. Well, bless you. That's uh, wonderful. Do you have children? Two girls. And any grandchildren? I have, yes, I have six, seven, eight, uh, six grandkids and two great grandkids. Congratulations, that's wonderful. Where and when did you enter the military? Well, 1942, right after Pearl, right after, uh, Right after the war was declared, we were waiting for the recruiting office to open to sign up. How old were you then? 22, 21 and a half, 22. 21, I guess, 20, 21, Plus. almost 22. And when you say we, did your friends do the same thing? All the friends, I, my brother and all my friends, everybody we used to hang around with, they were all waiting to sign up. You felt it was that important to oh, join? Positively. What branch did you join? Well, I wanted, all of my friends were joining the, the Marines. My brother, they're all. So, well, previous to that, after high school, I went to night school and learned electric welding. After that, after I knew you know, enough about the welding, I went down to Four River Shipyards and I, I was hired to weld. And I welded on the, the the wasp, the airplane carrier, the second one, the first one was, was, was bombed, the second one. Uh, the battleship Massachusetts, the destroyed, there's a couple, two or three destroyers were working on all those. And, uh, but then my, all my friends were gone. You know, they were all enlisted and they're all in the Marines, they're all over the place. So I said, what am I doing here? I'm the only one around here, so I, 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 won't, I, so I left the, Deferment, I could have been deferred for the rest of the, of the war. But I, I went down, the first place I went was the Marines. So they looked at me and all that, and they, after they examined me and all that, and they said, we can't accept you. Now, this is 1942. So I, I said, what are you, why, what's the matter? My front teeth overlapped my bottom teeth for, uh, by a fraction. And they says, we can't. I says, what? I said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bite the enemy. <laughs> so then I went to the, the Navy, and it's the same thing. So then I went to the uh, Army Air Corps, and they, they pulled me in. <laughs> they did, and talk about what is the Army Air Corps? It's, it, was, it was the Air Force before the, you know, it started before the war. And these were all the planes that we, I flew B-24 Liberator. There's the B-17s, the P-38s, the P-51s, all those. That's what the Army Air Corps. Uh, in 19, and in 1946 or 47, Congress changed it so that now the Army Air Force come in, the Blues. And we were Army, so we were all done. And like I keep saying, <laughs> The Army Air Corps, we did all the work. We dropped the bombs and we killed and all that stuff. And in 1945, the war was over. The Blues came in in 1946 or seven. So I said, sure, we did all the work and they get the credit. <laughs> <laughs> when you first joined the Army Air Corps, where were you sent for basic training? Fort De well, I went to Fort Devens. And uh, they, what they do is they they lined us all up and we had to take all our clothes off and put them in a bag. And my wife was there and my father and all that. And, uh, so when, you were married at that oh, time, at a married, very young yeah. age, yeah. Yeah, in fact, 
when I, after, when I, after I joined, we were getting ready to go overseas, and I come home on a furlough for about a month. We got married, and that was it. She, she came to me to Holyoke, Mass, where I trained, and after, from there, they sent me to New York, so then she, she came to New York, but she couldn't, I couldn't see her. We were, we were restricted. And so she went home, and then I went overseas. So you were first at Fort Devens. Oh, Fort Devens was a training. Yeah, well, I mean, first, and, and they examine you and all that stuff. And then from there, where did you go? Seymour Johnson Field, North Carolina. Had you ever been to North Carolina before? No. What was it like? What was your first thoughts no, about nothing. it? We were just with all the guys, you know, just nothing. My wife, then my wife come down there to visit me to Fort, uh, Seymour Johnson Field. And that's where we trained on uh, for the turrets for the for the for the the bombers the all the turrets all the turrets that that, that they have you know the the uh, the bottom ball with the guns the tail with the tar that was a uh, uh, what are the the tail gunners were then the front turret and the front and the, I was on the top the top turret and what they call I was a flight engineer. So did you have special training after BASIC to oh, become yeah. a flight engineer? Oh, definitely. And was that in North Carolina? Yes, yeah, Seymour Johnson Field. Then we went to Maxwell, uh, Max, Gunter, Gunter Field, Alabama. Then to Westover Field, Mass. Salt Lake City is where we got our crew. We got all the crews. They, they, that's where they formed all the crews. So you, from Fort Devens to Salt Lake City, how, what period of time was that approximately? Six months, uh, nine months. What did you like or dislike about all that training? I liked it. I mean, it was. I wasn't. I wanted it. You know, I I enjoyed. Not I, not that I enjoyed it, but I. I accepted it uh, as, a, as such. Once you, were you tested to show that you would be good a, flight, a good flight engineer? Well, they, they give you an exam, uh, color, 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 colors, and they give you all, you know, all a, a thorough test. Mm -hmm. And I passed. Uh, I was a little above average, I guess, and they, they accepted me. You have to be you know, you have to be pretty good. You have to be uh, physically fit, naturally. And uh, your IQ is going to be a little high. So it was, and they, I was accepted. A lot of guys are not accepted, and they have to go into the infantry or wherever they go. When you were in Salt Lake City and you were teamed up with a crew, yep. you didn't know any of them no. until you were teamed oh. up. And then from there, did you go overseas? No, no. Well, from Salt Lake City, we went back to Westover Field, Mass. Now, we were a crew, a regular crew now. We had a, a, you know, four officers and six enlisted men. And I was being trained on A-20s. That's a medium bomber. I was trained for them. And so they, and when we get going again, they, they put me on a, a heavy bomber. A B-24. That was ten guys. On the A-20 is about about four or five guys, six guys. But on the on the the B-24 Liberator, it was ten guys, ten fellows, four officers and six enlisted men. When you were trained, what exactly does an engineer on a uh, flight engineer do on a B-24? Well, he, he has to transfer fuel when it's ready, you know, because you've you got four engines going and the, the tank, you got a lot, a, lot, a lot of the tanks are in the wings and you got to transfer, you know, when the time comes, you have to transfer fuel. Uh, anything breaks or it's up to you to try and repair it, you know, up there, you know, you're four miles up, and it's 22,000 feet. And were you on oxygen? Oxygen all the way. Our pilot, the crews, after we were overseas, a lot of the crews, didn't, when they get in their plane, they took off and went up to about five, 10,000 feet. Then they put their oxygen on, 
because up to after 10, 15,000, then you need oxygen. But they put it on like 10,000 feet. They put the stuff on, all the armor and all that stuff. So my pilot says, uh, my pilot was a West Point graduate, a wonderful man. My pilot says, well, you will put your equipment on on the ground while you, as soon as you get in your plane. So what if we're starting to go up and we should, we're being attacked? You won't have time to put that stuff on and, you know. So he was true and all that. So as soon as we get on, we, we put their oxygen on and the armor, the May West, in case we over over the channel. And know. tell us what a May West is. It's a vest <laughs> that you inflate if you're in the water. When you if you had to go in water, you inflate and it keeps you afloat. So after you and you put that on, after all the harness, the parachute harness, and everything is on, because if you put that on first, then you put all the harness on, and you try to inflate it. <laughs> you, yeah, it tightens everything so, up. Yeah, you can't. You, you, get, you put the May West on after. After. Once you trained with your group of 10, yeah. how, long did, how long did you train with them before you went overseas? Well, like I say, Salt Lake City started it. Yeah. From there to Westover. Mm -hmm. And then we were, we, were, we, were, we were assigned. We were all assigned. To, we were a crew. We were a regular, and we were buddy buddies then, you know. <laughs> And you did all get along well? Oh, yeah, we had it well, sure. And from Westover, you knew eventually you were going to be going overseas. Oh, yeah, definitely. Did you think you were going to Europe or? We didn't really know at, the, well, at that time. And I'm, I'm glad we went to Europe. I didn't want to go to South Pacific. And when did you go to Europe? Do you remember? Well, well we, when we got over, we had a, there was a stone, um, Gothic Bay, Scotland. Then from Scotland, we went to Stone, England. And from Stone, England, we went to our base, which was Adelbridge, which is uh, Norwich, England. And that's up the north, way up, near by the, way up near the North Sea. That was our base. That was all B-24s up there. And on south of us was all B-17s. So when you say all B-24s in this base in Adelbridge, how many B-24s oh approximately? Dear. Well, there's 12, usually about 12 or so in a squad. And we had a lot of squads. I, I really can't, I don't really know. And you were part of a squad? Oh, yeah. yeah and and what, what was the name of your group? The Ruptured Duck. The Ruptured Duck. That was the name of the plane? That was the name of the plane. And we had it on our jackets. And my radio man painted the ship. Both hit both on the on the nose, both sides, and all our jackets. He put the ruptured duck. Now the ruptured duck is a duck floating down with a parachute. I'll show you a picture. And he's floating down. This is a duck now floating down, and a and a bomb comes up right through here, and you see feathers flying. So he got ruptured, ruptured duck. That's great. <laughs> and what was your unit? What, what was your unit? What do you mean? The name of your unit. Um, I believe you told me what, prior to going on camera, you were with the 466? Yeah, 466 Bomb Group. Well, if you repeat that on camera, the 466, 466 Bomb, bomb Group. group. Mm -hmm. 787 Bomb Squad. And you mentioned earlier your pilot who was a good man. And yep. did he treat all of you equally? Oh, yes. He was strictly, uh, uh, in the air, it was business. All on the ground was a little different. We call him Bud. Bud? Bud Weiser. What was his? His name was Louis Weiser from Indiana, from, in, from Indiana. W-E-I-S-E-R? -E yes. Weiser. And you said he was a West Point grad. Yeah. Um, so would you fly out of your base in England? Yeah. Every and day. and uh, did you know ahead of time where you were going oh to be yeah, going to? Definitely. Tell we us had, what a typical day well, would be Well, when you like. get up, uh, when you, when you're, you're going to, that day you're going to fly, they get you up about 6 o'clock, 5, 6 o'clock, 
They take you over to the mess hall. You have a little eat. Then from there you go to a big, big room, an interrogating room. It's a big room, and they have a screen, uh, a screen and maps and all that. And we're all in there, all the La Mayan 740, uh, 747 squad, maybe 12 planes from us. There's 10 in each plane. We're all in there. This squad's there, that squad. We're all, it's quite 200 guys in there. And so the officer is up on the, on the stage and he tells you, he shows you the map where you're going. You know, he tells us just what to, what to ex you, you can expect a lot of flak, heavy flak, or it's, it'd be a bomb, uh, a milk run. But uh, it, they're usually not milk runs. He says they are, but the, we're always getting hit. You know, fighters or, or flak. So you'd, you'd finish up there and you'd all take off? So after the interrogation, the crew, the crux takes us over to our planes. And uh, like I told you, as we get, we, after we, as soon as we get in the planes, we put all our harness and we're at our position, you know. And then the, the pilot comes in and all that and then we take off. Now we're in line, we're following the people in front of us, you know. What time of year was the beginning of this? Uh, oh, I don't know. I know it was Christmas. One of the missions was on Christmas. St. Not St. Lowe. St. Lowe, we hit St. Lowe when it was Christmas Day. It was snow on the ground. Now, I, don't, I forget what mission that was. That was the sixth, the seventh, something like that. How many missions did you do? I did 16 very hazardous missions. And then I got hit. Before you got hit, because we'll get into that in a minute, your first time up. Yeah knowing that you might hit some flack. You're a young man, 21, 22 yeah. at this point. Yeah. Um, what were you feeling back then? Do you remember? No, you were, you were I, don't know, I, I don't know how to explain it, but you were a young, young fella and you're, in your, you're, you're, you're doing your mission, yeah, it's your mission, and when you're looking way ahead, it's, you know, you're up 22,000 feet. And there's clouds under you and all that, and there's all the other planes are aside of you, you know. And uh, so, and another thing is that we're the pilot's eyes, because your 12 of us are flying pretty close. They want you as close as you can. So if this plane gets a little close, a little closer to you, you tell the pilot, evasive action at three o'clock. Then he'll he will he'll fly the plane away like this or. Whichever way, whichever way the, the gunners tell him. You know, because we're here, like I say, we're his eyes. Because a lot of the planes, the planes will come up in front, because they're trying to get in position too, you know. Right. They can't see you or something. And the, so we're the, we're the pilot's eyes. Now, what was it like in the plane? You're in leather uh, or canvas? What oh were no. you wearing? Well, we have, uh, cheap, well, we have, uh, we have electric suits, electric. A, a pants are electric, the jacket's electric, and uh, you plug it in. You actually plug it in oh, in the plane? Oh, you have to, yeah. It's, like I say, it's 45 below zero at 22,000 feet. And we have nylon glo hand gloves, and on top of that we have the electric gloves. So that if you, if you had to fix the plane up there, you, you take your gloves off and you do what you have to do, but if you didn't have the nylon on, and you just took your gloves off, your, the, your skin, you would touch the metal and it would stick, you know. So you'll make sure you, you left your nylon gloves on, and you had to do whatever you had to do, and then you put that stuff back on. Now if something else in the plane broke, did you have to go to other parts of the plane? Oh yeah. Was that difficult because you're in very close well, quarters? Well, it was. You, you're in tight quarters, and you have all this harness on. On not the parachute. Now the parachute, I left it on the right on the deck, right right aside of me in case I needed it. I get it, and you clip it on and jump. But if I had to go in the back or to the tail, you, it's close. It's pretty close, and you're gonna watch. You know, you're gonna watch what you're doing. Now, along with you as an engineer, you had gunners, 
as well, you mentioned. Well, I was, I was and you a were a gunner I was also. A gunner. So along with being the eyes of the pilot, fixing things that might not be working yeah. appropriately, you also had to shoot. Oh yeah, definitely. So, that was our main fact. That was our main purpose was protect the plane. So now, Saint Lo, talk about Saint Lo because yeah. That was well. That was one of the ports that we had a bomb, and we went down pretty low. I don't know. We went down pretty low, and we could actually see the guys down below on the ground shooting at us with their rifles. Not that they would, they would be lucky or something, and they hit the pilot or some of them. But they went. We could see. And that's how low we were. I don't know why we went down that low, but we went down that low, and we took off, and we bombed, and we come back. Sixteen missions over what period of time? Well, probably six months. Six months. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Nine months, six months. And when you weren't on a mission, what were you doing? Well, you, you, if, you, if we didn't have to fly that day, we'd go down. We go. We could probably go to London on the weekend. We go to London, take the bus. The bus will take us to London. Uh, one time we were. I had three or four days off. We went to Scotland and uh, looked around, you know, and then come back. Did you write home a lot? Oh, yes. V-mail. V-mail. And tell us about V-mail. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, you, you write it in this little, little package, a little envelope with a, with a and that they V-mail it. They, they send it, they send it home. Was in it? fact, I have a few of them at home. I left, though. And do they, was it easy for you to get mail from home from your wife and your family? Well, it wasn't easy, but we we you got it. Get we it. get packages. I mean, some guy got a package and got some cookies or something, and then we all oh, well, all leave. See, we were a crew of ten, uh, not of ten, of six. The enlisted men were six of us. The officers had their own quarters. We were uh, uh, we used to live in Neeson huts. It's a metal hut with a pot belly stove and it would burn soft coal. And now the kids, the English kids, little kids, would come over and uh, we'd give them their laundry or, or such that we need and they'd take them home and have their mothers or somebody wash them and bring them back. And we'd give them apples and oranges. They never, they never, they're all rationed. They never saw any of that. So we'd, we'd be pretty good to the kids. So then we tell them, we need some coal. So that we used to burn soft coal in that pot belly stove. And they used to go and steal it from someplace, and, and get they it bring for us. You. They bring us the coal. So, so we used to reward them, you know. Now, when you mentioned going into London, did you see a lot of the devastation that we oh, hear yeah. about? Oh, definitely. How, how did that impact you? What I do you just, remember uh, about it? I hope I'm not in a hotel or, or drinking out of beer and the, the buzz bomb, they were shooting buzz bombs. The, Eng the Germans were shooting buzz bombs. And tell us what a buzz bomb is. A buzz bomb is a, is a rocket, like a rocket, with a, with a, with a, sh with a shot, two shot, with a shot wings, they had little wings on them, and a, and a rudder, and, they were, it's, all, and it's a bomb. And it had a uh, gasoline engine in it, so they would. And how they shot the, how they launched them was a big long. This was in France, right on the coast. A, a big long shoot, you know, big long shoot, 15, 20 foot long, 20 foot long, about uh, two foot wide, like a shoot. So that they would uh, put so much gas in the in this. In this, uh, what do I call it? Buzz bomb. The buzz bomb would take off, go on the chute, and take right off, and go over the channel, and when the gas let go and uh, used all up, the bomb would drop. And it, where, they don't know where, whatever it hit, it blew up. We have, I, I've talked to a few guys. They said, boy, you know, uh, I, I was at this hotel. And I, we had to go to another hotel because they didn't have wine or something. So we went to the other hotel and had a little glass of wine. A buzz bomb came and dropped and killed and blew up that hotel. The first one that they so were So he at. says, from then on, I drank wine all the time. <laughs> <laughs> now, they call it a buzz bomb because 
Did it actually make a putt, buzzing? Putt, 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 putt. So it you would knew? putt, 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 putt. Now, we had, not we, but the English pilots, they're pretty clever. They would, the buzz bomb was coming over, over the channel. The, the, pilot, the English pilots would take off and they'd get be one on each side of this buzz bomb. And they'd not touch it, but make with the wind or with the breeze, they'd, they'd turn the buzz, buzz bomb around. And they'd go back over the channel and drop in the channel. Not many of them, but quite a few of them they did. They were a lot of them they couldn't. That. They couldn't, it was too late, or, you know, it was sure. the, uh, the, the gas let go and it would drop down. Now tell us, with all your missions, you were in a direct combat, obviously. Oh, yeah. And tell us about the 16th mission that you were 16th mission? Well, before the, before the 16th mission, we had, I had one mission, we had one mission to go to General Patton. He's a tanks. And he went, he went so fast that he ran out of supplies. He didn't have any gas and all that. And uh, so we had to fly in gas to him and the five gallon cans in the bomb bays. And, and was he in Germany at that point? Oh yeah, he was, if he had let him go, he would go right through Russia. <laughs> but anyway, it, we had a brought, uh, not only my plane, but on quite a few other planes, we had to supply him with gasoline. And another mission, we had to fly food, boxes and boxes of food to Holland. Now Holland was under German control. They were starving there. And so we had, you know, we dropped the bar, we dropped the boxes of food. And one little incident I'll tell you before that. Uh, we, were, my wife and I, after the war, or not we went to. Uh, oh dear. We went to uh, the Dutch island. Oh, I can't think of it, but it's an island. The Dutch owned it. So anyway, uh, we we're at the hotel, and there's a lot of GIs there, Dutch GIs, you know, English GIs, or whatever they were. So we got to talk in and all that, and I said, geez, you know, I, I used to drop food to your grandfather, your father. You did? Oh, I, I, and I had, they used to feed drinks to me. I, had, I drank all day, all week long, free. <laughs> Well, because they were so thankful oh, with yeah. your help. Oh, these were kids. You know, yeah. these were kids. I was a grown man. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. And any close calls leading up to your last mission? Positively. Tell us about some of them. Well, each mission, you know, uh, sometimes some missions we'd go and we would go and we we don't see any any ak ak. Oh, the ak ak was all further on. They never we never got hit, and we went in. There's no fighters. We went in, dropped the bombs, turned around and come home, no problem. Because every time we come back to the base, you have to land. When you land, you go into an interrogating room, like this, a big room, all the guys are in there, and you tell the interior, first of all, he brings in, the, the, it's an officer, he brings in a fifth of whiskey with glasses and he pass them out to you, you know, just to calm you down and all that. My radio man didn't work, didn't drink, so I drank his. That <laughs> mine. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they'd ask all kinds of questions, you know. What, what were some of the close calls that you would have? Well, there were. <laughs> and what was it like also? You're in this tight formation. Yeah. Obviously, you were seeing others shot oh, down. They were blowing up. They were side, right side of you. They are blowing up. Uh, a lot of them, uh, a friend of mine was in a plane on the side of me. He was on the same, on the same outfit. So I asked, I told, asked for the, you know, a couple of the guys to watch to see how many shoots come out of that plane. And about four or five shoots come out. And they, then the plane blew up. Another one, the plane, uh, you, you'd, be, you'd be fine. One day, we used to, set, uh, we used to drop chafe. You know, you know the silver paper you put on a Christmas tree? Yes. You know, the chafe. Well, this used to come in packages about this big. We had boxes, boxes like this, 20, 30 boxes, or oh, not that many, but on a plane. And on the side of the plane, we have a little opening this big, a three, four by four, or something like that. So you take a package out and you put it in that, that 
little hole called the fuselage, and the wind stream would take it, and it would trickle down, and it would, it would follow up all their radar. You know, the radar screen down below uh, for their act act shooting at us, you know. So we like uh, sometimes they shoot and the plane, uh, plane uh, shell would explode pretty close and it would you know, rock the plane or it would scratch the side. We said, oh, so we'd, geez, we'd throw out more, <laughs> get more. So when we've seen pictures dating back to World War II where there's been that. Yeah. It almost looked like stringed paper. Yeah. That was Sil chafing. Sil yeah, Sil silver like chafing. silver paper. Mm -hmm. And that would trickle down and, you know, they, they have a radar screen with their guns, you know, and it would screw up their, their radar. Yeah. Anything that would help. <laughs> Anything. Right. Yeah. Right. All right, then one time we're flying and the front of our plane got hit. We, you know, we thought it was, oh my geez, a bomb. The guy in front of us, the plane in front of us, he threw out the whole cardboard box. He threw it out, and that hit our nose and broke the nose. And we, you know, we said, we said, you jerk, you, you're supposed to take the, the little packages out and throw them out. He got so excited, he threw the whole box out. Which could have. Well, it could have. If, if that hit the pilot or the window shell of the pilot and smashed the pilot, you know. Did you make, but you made it back to the base okay? Or did you have to do a special landing? Oh, no, no. We made every day, every, every mission up to the fifth, up to the 16th, every fifth, you know, the 15th, we went back to our base, we got over the, our routine was you go over the, over the channel, come down from North, North England, come around London, go over the channel, Go through France. Now it all depends on when you, who you, where you're going to bomb. My first mission was Munich, Germany, which was five miles, five hours in, drop the bombs, and five hours back. So, like I say, every morning, you, you, not every morning, but every mission you do, you go over the channel and into France, Germany, Berlin, Hamburg. One day we were dropping, we, were, we had to bomb Hamburg, Germany. And you'd, uh, we're going parallel with uh, Hamburg, which is right there. So we're going this way. Oh, um, and there was all kinds of flak. When the flak, when, a, when, a, when they shoot a shell and it explodes, it's a black puff of smoke. So when you see black puffs of smoke, the bomb has already exploded. So we looked over and there's the whole wall. They're all full of black puffs of smoke. They said, oh my God, I'm glad we're not going over there. We're going this way, you know. All of a sudden we turned, the whole crew, all the, all the planes turned, and we went right through, right, right over Ber Hamburg, Germany. We dropped our bombs and we turned around and come back. So you come back out through Germany, France, over to the coast, then you go up to Belgium, you uh, go through Belgium, and into Holland, and the Holland is where we turned to go over the channel. So uh, you're sort of a little relaxed then because you're almost, you're almost on the channel, you know, but... Uh, In safe quarters. Well, yeah, yeah. You hope. You take some of your junk off, you know, and all that. But the day I got hit... <laughs> what day was that? August 15th, 1944. We were... We were where the hell were we? We were, we were bombing an airfield. And we went in. Where? In Germany? In Germany. Mm -hmm. We went in and dropped the bombs and coming out, okay, no, no problem. We, there was a lot of flak, but we could hit with the flak, but it would scratch the plane or nothing would damage the plane. And we'd come in over from Germany to France to the coast, up through Belgium to Holland. Like I say, there we're going over the channel and we were sort of relaxing like, well, we had and all this mission, we had fighter escort with us all the way, over in the Hamburg, uh, the airfield, and come back all the way, right up, to, right up to Holland. And that's where the fighters, our fighters, left us, because we were almost you know, going over the channel. Soon as they left us, 28 uh, German fighters were waiting for us, and they come down. Soon as our planes left, the, the, our fighters, they come in, and they knock down three bombers right off the bat. I was in the second 
second ball, second ball, second lead. They come down again, and in the meantime, don't, don't forget the, uh, the lead plane is calling the fighters, come back, come back, because they went way down, way, way down. But on the way up, see, in the second time, the German fighters, they formed again, they come down, they knocked down another three bombers. Well, that's 60 guys. There was 12 of us, 12 planes. We were, we were lagging behind the big, big group of a thousand airplanes. We were sort of lagging. That's what we call, what they call stragglers. We were stragglers. They were forming again the second, the third time. In the meantime, the fighters, our fighters come up and dispersed them. In the meantime, we're firing, you know, firing, and that's when I get hit. I was, I was, that day I was in the waist. The, on the waist, wing, the waist gun, the, you know, the gun on the waist wing, uh, window. And the shell, they were shooting 20 millimeter cannons. We were shooting 50 calibers. I got some, I got some in there, show you. Uh, a 50 caliber, how big a 50 caliber is, this big. And it, an explosive. In other words, it hit the plane and explode. Well, when I get hit, they were shooting, and it one right, right underneath the window, right on the right. It hit that, exploded. The nose of it, of the, sh the nose of the shell, is as big as your thumb, went right through me, right on the side, went through the intestines, and out the, the pelvis, and broke all the pelvis, and the shrapnel, all this shrapnel, besides the, the nose of it, hit me in the leg, almost cut my leg off. I got seven pieces out of here, two pieces out of here. Is, uh, that's, was, that was the shrapnel. The, the shell went through, and my bone, I guess, my pelvis slowed it down, and it fell on the deck. So that's why I still I have it. They found it, and they gave it to me. You know. uh, so I got hit, and I called the pilot. You know, I called him, I told him, hey, bud, I'm hit. So I, I try to get back up onto my gun. I kneel with my knees over to the gun. I try to pull myself up, I couldn't, so I just, just laid there. So the, the, the right race gunner, he was firing his gun and my gun, and all the hot shells were falling on me. Not that I felt them, but uh, I was losing my blood. I was losing blood, I was passing out back and forth, back and forth. So after we got, uh, we got, over the channel, over them from France up to Holland, up to uh, Bel uh, what the hell, Belgium, Holland, and then we're turned and we're going over the channel now. So he called, he told all the guys, throw out all the, all, throw what out what you can, throw the guns out, throw everything out of the plane to lighten up the load because we're going down. The plane, the plane was hit pretty bad and we're going down into the channel. So, and I'm just laying there, right? nothing I could do. Were you the only one that was physically hit I was the only one hit that, hit that, that, that mm -hmm. low. And the left waist gun had come over and he was holding me while going over the channel. And uh, I'd, I closed my eyes and he thought I, I was gone. But he tapped me on my helmet and I opened my eyes. And he said, but anyway, going over the channel, he, they, we had, they had to throw everything out. They were gonna throw me out too. I was gonna, the, the radio man was gonna parachute with me out. But if I did, I would never would have made it anyway. But they didn't. We made it over the channel pretty good. We were over, and uh, we got over to England, the, or the coast of England, and over the cliffs of Dover, over the mountains, and over and down. And our field was 15 miles from there about. And he landed. And in the meantime, he called all the guys that got up front and up the flight on the flight deck, because if the plane when we crash, we're going to crash. And it'll usually, they, usually the plane blows up. And so we, they want, as soon as we stop, you jump out, run, you know. So we, uh, we went up over the cliffs on the field and they had to crank the wheels down. Uh, we didn't have any hydraulics, no electric. The, plane, the, the wheels, they, the landing gears, they couldn't, they had to crank them down and you need a lot of power for them to lock. Well, they didn't lock, they just went down. Soon as they hit the, as soon as we hit the deck, the wheels collapsed and we're on the belly. And we're going off the, off the field, in, off the runway, into a, over a field, through the field, and then into the woods. And in the meantime, the, the ambulance is following the plane. 
because we we're on our base, you know, at the outskirts. And they knew. Oh yeah, they say injured because when we're coming in, you shoot flares, different flares meaning different things. Engine trouble, uh, per, uh, people wounded, you know, and all that. So the ambulance will follow. So we get down and we went through the into the the woods, and the trees are what knocked the wings half and half, and we was we stopped, and the plane didn't blow. I, I wouldn't be talking to you today. Right. But the radio man, uh, the tail gunner ran out and he ran into the woods. They had to chase him. He went, he went a little berserk. But they got him anyway. Out of fright. Out of fright. He was only, he was about 18 years old, mm -hmm. 19 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they got me out, I mean, then when the plane stopped, they, they come on and they had a bamboo stretcher. They put you in the bamboo stretcher, and they, it's and the, they lock you up, and I and then the and on the the bottom where I was, there's a, a there was a, a opening, you know, open you open it up, and there's where they take you out of the plane, so the plane was up up like that, so they took me out and they brought me into the ambulance to the, our field to our base, the flight surgeon at our base saw what was saw what was happening. And he called for blood. He called for uh, blood transfusions. You know, all in the field. Anybody, come in. I have all kinds of blood in me, <laughs> but it kept me going until I can get to the hospital, which was 21 miles away. So they got me in there. Well, I was knocked out. They got me in there about two days later or so. I woke up and and I saw a you know, woman around, uh, young girls around the the, the the foot of the bed. And I'm saying, women, 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 not there any men around? They said, why, what's the matter? I said, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how to put a duck, and they called that a duck. You know? mm -hmm. So then from then on, then, then about uh, the guy that operated on me was a... And this was in England. This is in England, yep. I'm in, in England. Uh, the guy that operated on me was a, uh, a colonel from World War I. His name was Lieutenant Colonel Pedro Plato. And he operated on me and he saved me because he had all the bad cases. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I was still alive. Uh, so what kind of operations did you have to have? Well, after, after, after way after, I talked to one of the corpsmen that worked on me. And he said, well, he said, they cut you open from here to here. They open you up. They take out all the intestines and they look for holes. You, you, know, you got 22 foot of inte small intestine. So they look for holes and this and that. He said they mended about three or four inches of it. All the rest of it was no good. So they cut it and they put it back, uh, they hooked it up again. And put it. So uh, when I was teaching up at uh, Waltham High, so I was saying, we're talking about that, I was saying something, that, and some of the girls, young kids were saying, I says, I have to go to the bathroom faster than you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, just something for a joke. You know. And your pelvis had to be healed? Well, yeah, that, that was busted, that was broke, they fixed that. Here, this, this here was up like this, and they took all the trap, not all of it, quite a few of it, they said, then later, I used to get lumps here and here and here. It would be and shrapnel. The shrapnel uh, and the, <clears throat> and the, the, the surgeon, whatever, he said, oh yeah, so he'd just nick it and take the shrapnel. The shrapnel would go way in and then eventually, you know, work its way out. Travel you know? out. Now what about your leg? No, the leg was, uh, open. It's, oh, I can't show you, but a, a big hunk of the muscle was taken out. There's a big dent right here. And the, the, the pelt, it was broke, the bone was broke. And they put it in a, you know, in a brace and all that stuff. This here they bandaged. I couldn't, I couldn't write. So the nurses had to write for me to my wife, you know. Yes. What What happened? How soon after you were hit and in the hospital did your family and your wife, in particular, hear? And how did she hear? Well, telegram. Your husband has been seriously wounded. I will, you know, I'll keep you informed and all that, and that that's it. I still have, I have the, the telegram at here. And how 
Have you talked to her about how she reacted to that? Well, the, the telegram came, I was living in Belmont at her house, her mother's house at the time. So when the telegram came, my, my grandma, my mother-in-law don't speak, she can't read English. So she got the telegram, she knew the telegram, and I guess she, I think she had somebody read it for her, that I was seriously wounded and all that. But in the meantime, my wife was working. Where was your wife working? Hood rubber. And what was she doing? Well, the, I think she was so, Summer, uh, something about submarines. They were flat in the floats or, or something about the, that. So when she got home, she, two of her girlfriends were coming down the street, so she called her two girlfriends in to be with my wife. So she showed my wife, the, she gave them the telegram, and she read it, and she ran upstairs crying. So... You were in England, you were operated on Lieutenant Colonel Pedro, Pedro Plato. How do you spell his last name? Oh, I don't know. Plato. Plato. P -L P -A -P P -L -A -T -E -A -U yeah, P L A T E A U or something? No, oh, oh, stop. P L A T O? Plato? Plato. He saved your life. Yeah. How long did you stay in the hospital in England? Six months. And then did they transfer you home? No, yes, I come home in the hospital. Well, before that, Colonel Plato came in about three months later, and he says, the war's gonna be over in such and such a time. And I said, no, nah, it won't, it won't. And it, uh, so he come in that day and it wasn't over. So he gave me a pound note, well, English money, that was worth five dollars then. I don't know what the hell, what it's worth now. But it's a pound note. And on the note he wrote to, to Tech Sergeant Mueller, who had the guts to take it, this, wig, this wager, wager is gracefully paid. And he puts his name. Now, who had the guts? He took my guts out. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he meant. Yeah. So you could maintain a sense of humor, but what was it like for you six months over there in the hospital, away from family, away from your buddies on the plane, yeah. what was it like for you? Well, at the beginning, I was, I wanted to die. You know, it was, they were putting tubes in me and this, and they were doing all kinds of, oh my Jesus. I said, oh, Christ, let me go, will you? But after, then, then I, then it was, you know, I got better and all that, and I was okay. Now, while you were there that six months, were you able to walk, ambulate? Oh yeah, oh yes. Yes. In the hospital, this other fellow and I, one guy was from Brooklyn, uh, Brook, Brook, uh, Brookline, Mass. So there we had all, wall, all, wall, all the rooms off this corridor and then the big ward in the back over that side. So they'd come up with supplies, you know, a big cart, push a cart with supplies in each, each little kitchen, you know, they'd give supplies. So he'd come up, this is about, I don't know, 11 o'clock at night or so, and this other guy and I would sneak out and it was Nescafe coffee. That was just starting then. So we'd, we'd steal it, you know, and the guy, the guy didn't know it. He didn't care anyway, he'd come up. And, so the nurses knew we'd had the Nescafe coffee. So about 10, 12 o'clock, one o'clock in the morning, they'd come up and say, come on, Carl, let's have a cup of coffee. You know? So we'd go, we'd go with the nurses into the kitchen and we'd have a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. but now, the, we recently interviewed a woman who was not a nurse but was with the Red Cross. Yeah. And she said she would come in and write letters for yeah, the, the yeah. veterans and, yeah. and, you know, get gifts for them or yeah. help them. Did yeah. you find that was the case? The nurses for us. The nurses I did, did that. I had Wonderful, wonderful. They were young kids. I was, they were my age. Yeah. Nurses. One nurse was a little older, and she was from Plattsburgh, New York. And she lived with her grandmother and all that. So when I, uh, when I got home, well, our, <laughs> I was in England for six months. After I come home on a hospital ship and all that stuff, uh, they sent me to Atlantic City with my wife for a month. 
and to recuperate, or, or I don't know what they call it, but the, my wife. And they, uh, my wife says, look at this, all on the tables. And this the second floor was all married couples. Uh, they had chocolate, Hershey chocolate bars, and they had all kinds of stuff where back home, that you couldn't have, there's none of that, you know, none of that stuff. Because there was rationing and... Yeah, yeah. When you say Atlantic City, was it a hospital base? It was, it was the, one of the hotels. Okay. We were on the second floor, it was a room, you know, our room, and uh, mm -hmm. that was all married. It was a regular hotel, so all the hotels. We took, a, the, the military took over all the hotels. All the, all the, the benches on the walk, on the boardwalk and all that was for military personnel only. Well, that's all that was there anyway, so. And but I stayed there and I played ping pong with Donald O'Connell. Remember Donald O'Connell? Singer dancing in the yeah, rain and all of that? I played with him and he let me win, you know. Was he in the service also? He was visiting no, no, no. as he a, was a uh, uh, like USO or yeah, something? Yeah, mm -hmm. he entertained him as a fellas. Was he a nice guy? Oh yeah, he was a young kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how long did you stay in Atlantic City? One month. One month. Okay. And then were you re-hospitalized? No, then from Atlantic City, I come back home to, I mean, to, to Waltham, and from there I got orders to go to Plattsburgh, New York, to the Air Force Hospital. It was at Plattsburgh, New York. And that's where the, my nurse was, was uh, her, she used to live. So when I got to Plattsburgh, New York, I, uh, I was assigned the, you know, in the war and all that, they were taking all kinds of tests and all that. I went to see her, and she gave me the address, and I went to see, her. there was an old, her grandmother. And, uh, you know, I, hello, I spent a couple of hours with her talking and all that stuff. Because these nurses, these young nurses, they would write to my wife when I couldn't walk, when I couldn't walk, uh, couldn't write. And they were very, you know, very nice. Uh, I met some English, I met an English, this is in England, I met an English young girl. She was married and kids. So I wrote to my wife and I said, send, send, the, send some kids some stuff you know, to this address. So she did. The only thing is, I didn't realize duty. She had to pay so much money to, to, to get that package. If I'd have known, I would have given her the, you know, the money. The, but I, 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 did, I tried to do a good thing and that was it. So you then ended up, what was it like going over on the hospital ship? Oh, it was good. I mean, not good. It was, it was all right. It was uh -huh. okay. You know, they were all, not all injured, but there were a lot of guys coming home, and I was, I was in a room with all the Air Force fellows, you know, that, that's all. Now, when you mentioned you, you had, let me just jump back a yeah. little bit. When you had the crash landing, you were the only one injured? I was the only one injured. And you all made it out of that airplane? Out of that airplane. Tell us, did they all make it out of the war? No. Tell us about that. When I got, after I got in the hospital, uh, they used to come, they used to, the crew used to come and see me. You know, my officer came, and I, I'll tell you this one thing. This, this young officer came, the lieutenant, and I'm in bed. I was, in the, I was the only one in the room. It just at that, for them, I was pretty serious and just one in the room. He come up to me and he came up and he's like that and he, I had to sign some papers. So he come over, he, he, he started walking away. And he said, oh, wait a minute. He took his release and he, just, and he took out. Yeah. He took out the purple hat. He took out the purple hat. Oh, thing. show it. He show took it out us. the purple hat. And he flung it at me. Honestly, well, I didn't. He, I didn't mean. I don't mean he. You know, he just. He was standing over here, so he just he flung it. So I didn't think nothing of it. But then when you get home and you hear about these guys standing in review, and the general comes and puts the medal on them, and all, I said, look at that. This this guy, this lieutenant, threw the damn thing at me. Why don't we show it to those who are looking? Because it's a beautiful piece. Why don't you hold it up this way? And I think my name is in the back. I don't know. Let's just hold it one second. I think my name is in the back of that. 
Can you see that, Dan? Now, I got the purple heart, and I got three clusters with that. Which is a big deal. Well, because of the, of the other wounds. I could hit with one shell, but then with the shell, all, of, all of the shrapnel hit me all in other different places. So they give you one purple heart with three clusters, because I hit three places, my leg, my chin, my hand. And then the big one went through here. That's the purple That's heart the one. That's the purple heart yeah, one. These, these are the clusters. Want to show those? But uh, this, then, this is the air middle. Every, every, six, every six missions, they give you an air middle. If you show that, tip it and show it to the camera. That's beautiful too. But I have, uh, I have three of these. So six, you had this. Yeah. yeah. The other guy, they did see at the at our when we were flying, you had to do four, thirty missions, and you send you home. Like I said, I only did sixteen. So. Now tell us about the rest of your crew. Yeah. You you were the one injured in nineteen forty four. Yeah. The rest of them walked away. Of that of that. And plane, tell us yeah. about the rest of your crew after well, the fact. Well, uh, after. When I was in the hospital, I don't know, maybe a week, two weeks, my, uh, and this particular day, the crew didn't have to fly that day for some reason or other. So my pilot, like I told you, was a West Point graduate. He was gung-ho. He was a major. He, he, took out a, he took a green crew out, another crew, another plane, our plane was left, you know, behind it. Our men were relaxing, but he took this green plane, this green crew out, and he stood between the pilot and the co-pilot in the back, and you know, if they made a mistake, he'd tell them and all that. So they're over Germany, they're over France, over France, and they got hit with shrapnel and it blew the plane up. Fifteen of them got killed, not fifteen of them. But the whole plane up, the 10 of them got killed. And then him, that's 11. Uh, like I said, then the radio, like a, the tail gunner, he went, he went berserk. So did they help him? Did, did they put him in hospital Not and then. help they him? sent him home, they come home. He come home on a hospital ship with me. Come home and then he went to Grand Rapids, Michigan and then that was the last we heard of him. And then we heard, we heard he was put away, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's he's okay now. He's mm -hmm. okay. Um, there, was, there was one thing I was going to see. I can't. Others remember. on the sh on your plane. Oh, your crew. When, uh, not only uh, away from that. This is something else. On our, our crew, our whole crew, ten plane, ten guys. The pilot was a German Jew. The radio man was German. We're all American, though. He, he was a German Jew, German. The left waist gunner, the right waist gunner was German. I was Italian. And there's, I think there's another German there. I said, Jesus, if they ever shoot us down and they line us up and they'll say, well, the Jew, they'd shoot every one of us right off the bat. <laughs> Now, of that crew, could any of them speak the oh, language? Oh, sure. And That's, you could speak Italian? Yeah, but a little bit, not much, a little mm -hmm. bit. But the German one, he lived in New, uh, Newark, New Jersey. I used to go over and see his mother, his mother, father there, German, you know, beautiful, wonderful. The, the pilot was from Indiana. I didn't go see him. I talked to his sister in, in, in Indiana, but mm -hmm. after he died, mm -hmm. that was it. Uh, so getting back to you then, you came back, you were at the Air Force Hospital yeah. in Plattsburgh for how long? Six months. So you were in the hospital for a One whole year. One year. I got hit in August 15th, 1944. I was discharged August 14th or 15th, 1945. Now the day of the discharge, uh, the guys were, were doing everything possible to get discharged. They were saying different things and all I said, so, so I said to, to myself, I said, well, you know, what can they ask me? What, what can I? So anyway, when the time there, there was going to be a discharge, 
these guys, uh, I, had, I had to go in front of three officers. They were, and I saluted them. And they says, uh, Soldier, what's your name? What's your, what's your serial number? And I said, 11089972. That's it. Goodbye. And I was discharged. And you were a sergeant at that time? Oh, yeah, tech sergeant. So you're, you're discharged from New York. Your injuries. Oh, they, they were terrible <laughs> at home. I couldn't do, I was throwing up all, you know, I was very, I couldn't eat, like I like Italian food. And you can't, I couldn't eat it, like spaghetti and sauce and stuff. I can't eat it once a month, maybe. But I used to sneak it in, you know. I'd get sick and throw up and you know, all that stuff. Uh, when you came back home, did you come back to Waltham? Waltham. With your wife? Yeah. What was it like coming home? Well, I, I went to Belmont. For, when I come home, I went to Belmont with my wife's mother. And Waltham was putting up housing for the vets. So I, I, I put in for you know, put in for one. And we had a wait, and there were Navy barracks from Rhode Island that broke down and shipped up to Waltham and put up. So I got one of the Navy, I got one, I got one. And uh, one of the apartments. And there I had my first daughter. Uh, I got out in 45 and she was born in 47, I think, something like that. And then uh, we stayed there five years and, and, and then I bought a home behind Murphy Army Hospital. Have you heard of that, Murphy Army Hospital? It was a big 500-bed Army Hospital in Waltham. Now, when I left, there was no hospital. But when I come back, there was a big, big hospital, 500 beds. Now, they used to, from the Waltham train station, they used to come up near Bentley College, up that way, and into the hospital with the ambulance from the, the patients who were coming in back and forth. And at that time, it was only a cow path. You know, the trees were touching. So the colonel called, got Washington, he got money and all that, and they made, they opened up the road and made it wide, nice, so that the ambulance could come back and forth, back and forth. So then I, I they were building right, right, right in front of that. There was a, a little development. So they, they, he built these 28, 28 home, houses, all ranch houses. So I bought one, and all the other ranchers, all the other fellas, they were all GIs. They were all, we were all military. So, uh, like I say, I, we, we built the, uh, we, we moved there, and then a year later I had the other daughter, next daughter, and that was it. <laughs> Two, two is enough. <laughs> and are you still in that ranch house, or? I am still there. Do you remember what you paid for it? Yep, twelve thousand dollars. And I had a. He took a thousand dollars off if I painted my own. If I painted inside, the, you know, the living room, and the, I said, I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So you're a year in the hospital. You come home, and within a few years after coming home, you. You start and have your family. You buy your first home. Yep. Um, did you discuss with your family or friends what had happened to you or your experiences? Well, see, a lot of the fellas don't want to talk. Right. I didn't mind talking. I don't know why, but I, I just talk. Once I get started, I just talk and talk and talk about it. It doesn't, I thought it was a, an honor I, you know what I mean, at the time, I thought it was wonderful that I could go in and get in there, and I joined the Air Force. That was just what I wanted. And I did my duty, and that was it. Did you join any unit of the military reserve when you came no, out? No, nope. Did you join any veterans organizations? Oh, yeah, positively. What did uh, you do you disabled, disabled American Veterans, mm -hmm. the VFW, uh, American Legion, those are the military ones. Mm -hmm. Then the Elks and a couple of other little other ones. You know. Are you still active in those? Oh, the, the VFW we are. We go, now the VFW in Waltham, we have our own club and all that stuff. 
Every third Thursday of the month, we go to Bedford Hospital. It's a group of us. And we take a 21-piece band with us, the Soft Touch. I don't know if you ever heard of them. Soft Touch, half of them are American Legion, the band, you know. But they come they, from work, they go right up to Bedford Hospital. And we do, we all meet. And we're all there by six o'clock. We bring uh, coffee, ca uh, coffee, donuts. The women bring donuts and they wrap them up. Uh, we have coffee, ice cream, the hoodsies. And, we pass those all out. But the, we go up, the fellas go up, the commander and I go up and all that, and the women come with us, as many women as we can. So the women, they pass out the stuff, we do too. Sometimes we have Boy Scouts there, they help us, they pass And this out. is a veteran's hospital. Veteran's Bedford Hospital mm -hmm. that's been there since World War I. Mm. But that's uh, Norris, what's her name, Rogers, the congresswoman, but anyway, we go, like I say, we go there, and uh, the women, when the band gets there, they play, stop playing. The women get up and they dance with the wheelchairs. Wonderful. They, they push the wheelchairs around, and we have, and then we pass out the, 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 all the other the little goodies. Then at nine o'clock, we're all done, and we go home. The band goes home and goes to goes to bed, and get up and goes to work. We we go home and that, you know. What I'm saying is, they work all day. And they, they come there at night. It's beautiful. Now, how, when you came back from being in the hospital and from the war and you were discharged, how soon after that could you work? I went, uh, let's see, now, where did I work? I, uh, when I got home, I had a, a Murphy Army Hospital was there. I never saw her. But I used to go to outpatient there for different things because they had an outpatient, you know. I was still in uniform, you know, still. So then I said, geez, let me see. Maybe I can get a job there. So I went to apply for a job. And I did, and I got a job there. I worked at the, I worked at the, I was, as a laborer, no, a laborer. I couldn't labor, but I was, they hired me anyway. Mm -hmm. So then I worked, at, you know, I got the, do different things, and I got on the bulldozer, and the, I got all the equipment. I ran all the equipment, which is sort of e not easy, but it, it wasn't pick and shovel, you know. So then I got to be foreman of roads and grounds, and I uh, I had a crew of f uh, twelve guys, and some of the custodians, but uh, I stayed there. Nineteen. Well, I went in there in nineteen. 1946 or seven, and I retired in 19, uh, 1983. I had, tw I had uh, 40 year, 20 years, 40 years service. 40 years, that's with the military and the civilian government. And I had one year sick leave, a lot of the sick leave that I never used, that they gave me 41 years of retirement. See? That's remarkable. Yeah. Did you receive any benefits, hospitalization, GI Bill benefits? Well, I used to go to the VA, right. which was at 17 Court Street, Boston. I had to take the trolley, and every time I had to go there, they, had a, they were treating my hand. It was all swelled up, and my leg, and uh, they gave me different med medication, you know. But I had to go at least once a week. And that's the, like I say, take the trolley into the Harvard, and then from Harvard to North Station. And North Station, you had to walk up to, to Washington Street or West Washington. That's where the VA, that's where the VA was. Do, do you attend any reunions with your old crew and outfits? Yes, I did. Five, uh, about two years later, I went, uh, we had a reunion in, uh, in fact, it was in Cambridge, Mass., in one of the big hotels. So I was there. Then... Then we, the five years later, we went overseas with my, my wife and I. We went to England. We saw so you all, say five years after the war, you mean? Yeah, or after okay. I got discharged, mm -hmm. yes. We went, to, we went to England. And What uh, was it like going back? Well, it was good. I mean, the people appreciated it, and they showed it. Uh, they'd see you walking down the street, my wife and I walking, and I said, oh, geez, watch this. He's going to hit us up or something. Thank you, Yank. How 
How important to you was serving in the military? Very. Well, very, very. That was, that was our duty and we did it. No, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I, I wasn't like a few of them. They, they used to run, they run off to go, to go to Canada. Do you feel in some way it affected your life and how you moved forward in your life? No, but I'm still talking about the, my military history. I, I, I enjoy it. Yeah. I go to Bentley College, the Professor Gear, Richard Gear. now, the, not the movie actor, but this, that's his name. He calls me and he asks, and I said, well, you want me to wear my uniform? He says, oh my God, yes, yes. And the, the students would come in, like a few times I have to go like one o'clock in, in, the, in the afternoon, and it's an hour and a half class, and then he has another class, two and a half, two and a half, half past two, and I had to wait around, have coffee, and, and then at 2.30, have another class. So I stayed there. Well, he loved it. He loved it. Then I used to get letters from them saying, thank you, you know, and this and that and all that. Not letters, but a card with everybody written, writing on it, you know. Uh, then I had one at Waltham High. They had one at Waltham High, which two classes. Two big classes down there. Oh my God! I said, "Oh," was that? and uh, you tell they, them your experiences. Yeah, oh yeah, that's all. And they say, "What do you? What do you? What do you do?" What are, I said, "I just tell them what happened to me. That's all. You know, what else can I say?" So many years went by that you weren't asked. And do you see, um, as I have seen, that since such things as Tom Brokaw's book. Yeah. Saving Private Ryan yeah. and things of that nature that have sort of highlighted yeah. the greatest generation yeah. that that more people younger generation is more interested in your stories. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and another thing I noticed too lately young girls more so than men than fellas young girls thank you. They, they thank do. me. Yeah. Uh, few of them now I go for breakfast every morning. There's a few guys there, they're from Canada. They're here, they're citizens, I guess, I don't know, but they, they always, hey, Carl, hi, Carl. So come uh, Veterans Day, they buy me breakfast. They said, this, this, is for, this is thanking you for what you did. That's great. Now you also mentioned before we went on camera that you meet at Hanscom Field. Yeah. Who meets there? With you, all well, we go once a month. The sixteenth of the month, it's on a Thursday. We meet at Hanscom Field at eleven o'clock. Now, who we who they are is a B seventeen crew, a crew of B seventeen that flew the B seventeens. Uh, we have a couple of Navy guys there. Now they're not Air Force, but they're, it's open to any you know all of us. But most of them are all Air Force. And a couple of Navy guys, you know. Like one time we went on a group, we went to New Bedford up there where, where all the, the, the battleship Massachusetts and all that. So he was, the, he's Navy, and he was telling us all these things and all about the Navy. We didn't know nothing about them, you know. So it's a get together that it's you get -together. have. It's a get together. We have a terrific. meeting, we have a regular meeting and all that. It's a club, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we have we have to pay dues, and we get a magazine from national, from the you know we. It's very very nice, very nice. You've certainly shared a lot of memorable experiences and characters no. with us. Anything else in particular, uh, a memory that you haven't brought up, information about a particular person or anything like that? No, You've no. covered quite a bit. Yeah. Is there one other thought or anything you'd like to leave us with as we finish up this interview? I, uh, I uh, let's see. I worked, I knew this, I worked at Murphy, not Murphy, Mass Hardware. I don't know if you ever heard it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hardware store, big one. Well, the president of the hardware store used to be a kid that where we used to live on the corner, the guys on the corner, you know, we were big guys. Oh my, these little kids were there. We get, get out, of here. go home, get out of here. <laughs> that was one of the <laughs> the president. So uh, when I retired from the government and all that, uh, 
I, I went to see him, and he says, uh, I want to, you know, for a job. And he says, what, you want to start right now? Go ahead, start. I said, no, 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 let me, give me a couple of days, you know. So I was there, I think, for 22 years with him. With Mass Hardware. Mass Hardware, until that's, they closed. That's remarkable. Yeah. We so, then, so then civilian, uh, Waltham has that program uh, to help them, uh, senior citizens, you know, the program to work so many hours. And, that helps you with your tax relief? Yeah, my, I, they take one quarter of my tax out. You get four quarters, and they take one to, So I did that for about three or four years. And where did you work? Waltham Hospital, oh, uh, Waltham Police Station yeah. in the computer room. The, the sergeant that was in charge, he was uh, went to school with my daughter. <laughs> but anyway, he, it was a it was a it was a, a computer room where I I recorded all the when a policeman makes an arrest, he has to write a, a big sheet of paper, you know, on the paper. And there's thousands and thousands of these papers, so I take them all and I put them on a disc, small disc. So when the lawyer comes in for that one of those cases, he'd look at the disc and see it and there's all the information right on there. All these papers here, they destroy, you know, they get rid of. So that was my job for about three or four years. Beautiful, I loved it. And, uh, and you go in any time you want, you know, and all that, as long as you make up the hours. I forget right. what the hours were. But now I just, I replied again for this year and they called and they wrote a nice letter. There's so many applying for these jobs, the senior citizens, you know that uh, you make a little bit too much and we can't hire you. Mm. So I says, oh. <laughs> my daughter was mad. She says, what do you mean? She says, you, you're, 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 you know, you're in your age and you, you're a senior citizen and all that. You shouldn't be able to pay, you shouldn't be paying any tax. I said, hey, hey, hey. hey. <laughs> we well, I miss it, I miss it. Well, you're certainly <laughs> a credit, not only to your generation, but yeah. to all generations in your your activities and your continued yeah. activities are, are remarkable. Yeah. Carl Mueller, Carl J. Mueller, we want to thank you today for coming in and sharing your story with us. All right. Thank you so much. My pleasure.